I've had the privilege of being the manager of this since full time since 1977. And uh, like I say, I try to do textbook forestry and uh, it produces wood products and all the resident animals that we have around here, which are uh, white-tailed deer, uh, rough grouse, uh, turkeys, porcupines, beavers, squirrels, etc. Welcome to the North Woods of Wisconsin. We are here on some private property that I've been hunting for the past five years. Uh, the landowner is a, a lifelong forester and believes very strongly in managed forests and has been managing his property, which is, consists of hundreds of acres for many, many years. Um, he currently has a fairly large timber sale going on, as you can see around me. And he's always planning for the future. And today he's gonna to talk about some of his philosophy, his history and why he does it, uh, what it does for wildlife, especially the rough grouse, uh, white-tailed deer, and his objective on this landscape. So hope you enjoy it. And soon you'll meet Mr. Michael Amrine. Good morning, my name is Michael Amrine and I'd like to make a slight correction to the introduction that uh, Dave gave me. He referred to me as a retired forester and the only way I'm going to retire is when I die. I am passionate about this and I have been for many years. I was born, I'm 78 years old. Going on 79, I was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin during the Second World War. And I started growing t trees when I was about eight years old. And I used two of the seeds that were right in our backyard. And one of the species was a horse chestnut and the other one was silver maple. And I just didn't put them in the ground. My father was a greenhouse operator. The greenhouses aren't, they're painted white outside, but everything that is growing inside is green. Plants, tomatoes, things like that. So I had a controlled environment for my first uh, planting of trees. And uh, it's continued on for the rest of my life. When I was ready to go to the university in Wisconsin, at, uh, in 1960, they did not have a certified forestry school that was certified by the Society of American Foresters. So I went to the state of Michigan and in five years, I got a forestry degree and also a degree in uh, wildlife management. After graduation, when I got my diploma, I also got a draft notice from the Army, and uh, I didn't want to be away from the profession, so I chose the Army National Guard, and I stayed in for a total of uh, 30 years uh, with that uh, organization. I worked the first 11 years for the state of Wisconsin, and I made a mistake by taking a promotion. The, my initial assignment was in Brule, Wisconsin, which is on a river inside of a state forest. And uh, I made a mistake of taking a promotion. I went from one of the lowest level offices to the main office in Madison, Wisconsin. I lasted there almost 11 years and I dealt every day while I was wearing my tie 
with attorneys, legislators, and working on changing legislation. That is not what I went to school to do. And they gave me high blood pressure and hemorrhoids. So after 11 years, I says, I'm out. I resigned. I moved up here to Hayward, Wisconsin, and I've been actively management, managing our forested property since 1977. On this particular tract, there's a total of about uh, uh, almost 600 acres total. And I have visited every acre at least once. Where we're standing right now with the piles of aspen pulpwood, this was clear cut in 1977. So about 42 years later, I'm back again doing the same thing I did back in 1977. And uh, getting into a little forestry here, uh, aspen is a clonal species, which means that it sprouts mainly from the roots. And once you have aspen as part of your forest, it's just about impossible to get rid of it. So you better kind of tune your management to maximize the aspen production. And uh, what you want to do is, what you'll see in some of the other pictures, it looks like a tornado went through here. But uh, we've harvested all of the trees, uh, including some other species. And this will regenerate into aspen. And I've seen one place where they cut it. And the first year after it was cut, the height growth was six feet tall. So it goes from nothing to six feet tall most of the time it's three, four feet the first year, and you want to get it up there as fast as you can so you get above the deer and the rabbits and things like that. And it's, uh, like I say, a clonal species. That means that all the roots are hooked together under the ground. There's one uh, clump of aspen out in uh, Colorado or Montana, Montana that is 5,000 acres with the same tree, trees all hooked together. But that's the way aspen is. And uh, like you say, uh, once you have aspen, you might as well kind of keep it. One other thing I, I didn't get into before was, uh, you know, how you get started. If you have, uh, whatever your acreage is, 40, 80, or whatever it is, and you want to get started, I strongly recommend you contact whatever state you're in, contact their Department of Natural Resources or whatever name they have for it, and uh, get a hold of the forestry type people and start from there. And one comment about size, I've got you know, a large size tract here, but let's say you only buy 40 acres in uh, Michigan and you want to get started to manage it for forest products and grouse. Um, if you're thinking once you get started, you don't, these I don't have enough, you might want to talk to one of your neighbors on either side and see if you could go together, you know, on a timber sale and have hopefully good management on the whole property to produce grouse or deer or turkeys or whatever you're looking for. Right now we're standing uh, at part of a 640s or 240 acre tract. This tract was purchased by my parents in 1957 for about $2,700. And uh, I am managing this for the maximum production of forest products. And this tract was cut that we're seeing right now. It was clear cut in uh, like 1980, 1981. And the size of this 
particular tract of cutting is about 80 to 90 acres. And we also have with this timber sale another tract of 15 acres which we'll show you sometime later. One of the things that is important uh, when you have a, a forested tract of land is when you're considering having a timber sale to manage the property and uh, you need to work with a qualified forester that hopefully graduated from a uh, Society of American Foresters accredited school. And when you have a timber sale, you need to have a very good timber sale contract. Accordingly, it would include, you know, when the sale starts, when it's going to end, the prices. And another important thing on a timber sale is a performance bond. A performance bond is used in case the person who has the contract does not fulfill some of the items that are in there and that gives you the right to keep some or all of that performance bond money uh, during the timber sale procedure. So Mike, I have a few questions maybe that the private landowner might be interested in if they're looking to get started like you've done. You know, you obviously have a, a career and a background in forest, forestry and you know what to do and you've touched on who to get in contact with, but from a, a financial viability standpoint, um, what can a landowner expect to to get from his property? Is, is, he's, is he going to, uh, pay for the cost of the property. I suppose if he bought it 40, 50 years ago, that's possible. But if you bought it in modern times, is, it, is that the reason you should be doing this? I don't think that's the reason you need to have to buy a chunk of forested property. Uh, you buy it for hopefully the uh, practice of good forestry to maximize the forest products from the property but uh, I don't know if you can put a value on, you know, shooting a, a large deer or shooting a grouse or woodcock on a property. I, I don't know if you can quantify something like that. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's the total experience of having this, uh, you know, forested land and always leaving it better then you found it for those people that come after us. And uh, I've told that to my two sons who are actual owners of the property up here now. And uh, I've done a lot of the work. All they got to do is just kind of do touch up here and there and they will leave it uh, a lot better than, uh, than uh, it was when I gave it to them. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, are you going to make a million dollars? Nope, you ain't going to make a million dollars. That's uh, not really what you buy this for. Now, what would you say was if your experience, if any, with your adjacent neighbors or maybe trying to get them in the same thought process that you have and on why no. you do it the way you do? Is that a reasonable expectation? Do you think people are open to that? Uh, a lot of people have very uh, locked in thoughts about what they're going to do with their forested property. And the worst thing you can do is do nothing because I will guarantee you whether you're in West Virginia or the UP of Michigan or Montana or wherever it is that 
over a period of time, the, the quality, the density of whatever the forest products are on this property will go down. Now in this region, northern, northwestern Wisconsin, what is, uh, aspen obviously is your target species that you wanna, you wanna cut, you wanna grow. What is the reason for that? Is this, is this a local, uh, is it more locally viable in this market? Well, it, it, we're very fortunate here in Sawyer County. We have a Louisiana Pacific plant in Hayward that uh, buys this as it is stacked here and chews it all apart and glues it back together into four by eight sheets of, uh, I'll call it plywood, but it's you know particle board that's used in, uh, in house construction. Now you may have touched on this already, but your preference for clear cut versus selective cut or, or thinning operations is, is pretty simple. Uh, you wanna grow aspen, so what are, you, what are your thoughts on, on the clear cut? And, and because maybe a landowner sees, you know, the devastation, uh, so to speak, of, right. of the way a clear cut works, but what are the benefits of the clear okay. cut? Well, the, um, the benefits of the clear cut on this particular property is we have aspen, you, you're not gonna be able to get rid of it. So you wanna do textbook forestry, which requires you to cut it during the, the non-growing season and to eliminate any other stems so that the uh, aspen has 100% sunlight and can grow straight and tall. In the hardwood, uh, you don't normally clear cut that till at the end of maybe 100 years. Mm. In between time in hardwood like oak and, and basswood, you would go in and do thinnings. On this particular tract, um, before I had it clear cut, we did two thinnings and there had not been any cutting on the property for quite a few years. So it was in need of a thinning in 1977 and I did two of those and uh, then I actually clear cut everything and it's, it's, it's doing great. <laughs> Speaking about the actual logging operation, now they're doing what you asked them to do, obviously. Um, what is, how has your experience has been with the different loggers? You, you've, you've touched on that uh, earlier, that, that you've used several different outfits to, to do the work. What has been your experience in general with the well, loggers? Well, I... Are respectful for the property, the road system yeah, that you have, et cetera? Right. Well, I've been uh, quite fortunate. I, I did some studying before I wrote a contract with, I've dealt with uh, basically three different loggers since 1977. And I found one that uh, did a very good job of the thinning of the hardwood and the two thinnings and then the clear cut and uh, just like everything else, uh, they got old. One of the guys had a heart attack, and uh, that's why uh, when you're having a timber sale, you want to deal with the DNR or whatever it is to get an idea of the loggers that work in that area and uh, Talk to the uh, the DNR and talk to neighbors up and down the road. If you see a uh, timber sale that occurred a couple of years ago, go to the courthouse, find out who the name of that person is and give them a jingle on the phone and talk to them. It's, it's so important to see uh, uh, good forestry happen. We're gonna take a shot here in a little while, right across the street from this tract where I think it is, the forestry was done terrible on the property. I don't think there, a logger will come in there ever again with the way that the tract was left. Now when you first um, acquired this property, what did the wildlife look like back then before any management was okay. being done? 
Yeah, this uh, piece was bought in 1957 by my parents. And uh, there was, just like now, there is chunks of aspen. The biggest percentage of it is uh, two thirds is in northern hardwoods. And the northern hardwoods were definitely in need of a, of a thinning. And I remember, I think I was about 16, 17 years old when my parents bought it. And uh, I'd walk through the property and I don't think I saw more than uh, maybe two grouse on 240 acres. And uh, this property now produces a lot of grouse. It has produced a lot of, of uh, deer over the years. Uh, this is part of a over 500 acre tract. And my son has a hunting crew that comes up here. And <clears throat> in one year, I forgot how long ago it was, 10, 12 years ago, between bow hunting, gun hunting, and muzzle odors, just off of this less than 600 acre tract, 18 deer were harvested. Wow. 18 deer were harvested. And animals is a, you know, a renewable resource. And you can't just let them all live because uh, pretty soon there'll be a crash. And uh, so you need to harvest the trees and you need to harvest the animals in a proper manner and uh, have fun doing it. Okay, we're standing right now right across from the 640s on the Moose Lake Road. And uh, this track was cut probably seven, maybe eight years ago. Uh, it had aspen on it. That's basically what they cut and they left everything else. And the, the aspen needs for regeneration, 100% sunlight. Looking in there, I can't even see a small aspen tree. There's other hardwoods growing in there and you'll never get aspen in there again. This one right here to my left is dead. You know, and that's what's gonna happen. They're gonna die and just, this one will be on the Moose Lake Road here. Hopefully it doesn't hit a car the next big wind that comes along. But in my book, this is very, very poor forestry. We're standing uh, right next to a tract. If you're a Wisconsin resident, uh, this is owned by you and me. Uh, it's administered by the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. And they had an Aspen sale in here and that's all they took. All the other trees that are left here, uh, red oak, maple tree, but aspen did real good to start with. I'd say the sale was probably five years ago. And right here, these aspen trees, they're growing real good. But as soon as they hit the side branches of the oak tree, that tree will become junk. And they should have clear cut the whole thing. And I think the reason why that was left this way is because this tract hooks on to the Chippewa flowage. And I believe their association wanted uh, some aesthetics or whatever you want to call it. and. If I was your forester, and I would strongly recommend that you do this because Dave has hunted on the edge of this. There are some grouse here. I'm not saying they're not here, but it should have been done a little better in my estimation. Got those forest products out of there because you can't afford to go in and cut that anymore because you'll smash down too many of the good trees. 
Right now we're standing on a 40 acre tract uh, off the Lowry Road here in Sawyer County. And uh, this tract was purchased from the town of Round Lake in 1985. There was uh, hardwood and aspen on the property. I had it thinned twice and uh, again, there was enough aspen here that, uh, you know, I had to manage it for the aspen because it was so numerous. It was clear cut and also one of the things that happened here, I did what they call scarification. I had a large disc come in here and go over the brush, the stumps, everything to stimulate the, uh, the roots of the aspen and anything else that was on the ground. And uh, this was done in, I'm going to say 2004, 2005. And uh, you can see behind me, and I can tell you, I can't walk straight through the woods. I have to go at an angle because the trees are so close together. And this again is what happens if, if you do good forestry on the property. Okay, what we're looking at here now is a timber stand that I had clear cut in about uh, 1985. It was hardwood, uh, red oak, and a fair amount of aspen. And as you can see, we got a, a lot of aspen trees here now. Uh, within uh, 10 years, we'll be cutting in here and clear cutting. And looking at the height of these trees, uh, these trees are four and five sticks high, which is, if you get one six, that's about as good as you're ever gonna get. And this is really a prime uh, aspen growing area. And uh, this is a variety of aspen that we didn't talk about the varieties. In Wisconsin, we have the uh, quaking aspen and we have the large tooth aspen. These happen to be the large tooth aspen. They are more resistant to disease and grow a little longer than the quaking aspen. But uh, this will yield a tremendous amount of wood here within the next uh, 10 years. I'm standing here in a red pine plantation, but we're going to talk uh, aspen here for a minute. In my hand, uh, we have two different species of aspen on the property. Uh, on my left hand is called quaking aspen, and the other aspen is called large tooth. And you can see the, the large teeth and uh, the difference between uh, the two species of aspen. We're in the red pine plantation. This was a farm field back in the 1950s. And uh, this piece is uh, 300 acres plus. My parents bought this in like 1964. I added some onto the property. And this particular field at the time was uh, an open field was planted in 1980 with red pine. 
and they were planted in rows six feet apart and six feet between the trees in the rows. Since then we've had two thinnings of these trees. The first thinning, I'm standing in what uh, would have been two rows and we took two rows and left two rows all the way through the plantation. The second thinning was a marked thinning where in between where we had the rows we took out the poor quality trees. The next cutting will occur probably within the next 10 years and now all of these are high quality trees. Some of these are even the size they'll be uh, made into telephone poles or electric poles. And uh, like you see, it's uh, two thinnings already and uh, the breeze is blowing a little bit and it's uh, when you say, you know, what is it worth, you know, to have forested property? I like to hear the sound of the wind going through the needles of the plantation and I, I can't really put a value on that. Maybe you can, but I can't. just a temporary caretaker of that land. When you pass on, somebody else will be the owner of that tract. And uh, what I've tried to do on these tracts of land is be a good caretaker, a good steward of the land, and leave it hopefully a lot better than I found it.